in your uh, book you have a special sermon that I prepared called the lesser light but that's not the one we're going to study tonight <laughs> I give you that as an extra bonus actually I have several ways of approaching the spirit of prophecy some of you might have seen the series new perspectives on the spirit of prophecy there's seven sermons in that series and uh, actually the they are seven different approaches to studying the spirit of prophecy and uh, this evening I want to deal with one of those approaches to the spirit of prophecy before I uh, have a word of prayer though I would like to say that for those of you who were here uh, for the previous session where we spoke about the Sabbath uh, Remnant Publications is going to be publishing a book that uh, I wrote on the Sabbath and the portion that I presented is going to be included in that book as well as the Sabbath in Redemption and the Sabbath at the Restoration because God is going to break his rest when he makes a new heavens and a new earth he's going to reorganize this world and then and then he's going to invite his people to enter his rest because he's going to take six days to recreate the world and then the seventh day we will come from Sabbath to Sabbath to worship before the Lord according to Isaiah 66 but there will be a big difference you see at the beginning Adam and Eve did not see God create anything so they had to take God's story by faith but when God makes a new heavens and a new earth God's people will be alive we'll be able to see God perform the work of creation and then the Apostle Paul says that now we walk by faith not by sight but at that time we will walk by sight and not by faith and so in this uh, book it's going to be about a 70 page book uh, will be what I presented in the previous seminar as well as a chapter on the Sabbath and redemption some amazing insights into the manna episode uh, that we find in Exodus 16 there's much more there than meets the eye that is a fabulous messianic prophecy and then the Sabbath in the final restoration uh, it's written in a form that it can be used for missionary purposes and uh, you know it's uh, written in a real good narrative form that's easy to read and uh, I'm hoping that this book will be used uh, to reach out to people who are not members of the Adventist Church uh, because that's the main intention of this book is you know to uh, also increase our knowledge of the Sabbath but to be able to share this message with other people outside the Seventh-day Adventist Church now um, as I mentioned this evening we're going to study uh, the spirit of prophecy and before we do we want to have a word of prayer as we always do before we open the Word of God and so let's just bow our heads and ask the Lord's guidance Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, the awesome privilege of being in this place. How wonderful it is to see so many young people on fire for you and for your message. And Father, I just ask that you will take these young people and you will use them for the proliferation of your message and the finishing of your work for it's time to go home. And Father, as we study this very important uh, doctrine of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the spirit of prophecy, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We ask, Father, that you will forgive us for ignoring this gift and even perhaps attacking this gift sometimes. And I ask that this evening you will give us a new appreciation of this marvelous gift that you have given to your end-time church. We thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul compares the church to a body. And he says that even though there's only one body, the body is composed of many members. Among those members, of course, are the mouth and the tongue, the feet, the heart, the lungs, the eyes, in other words, the church is composed of many members like the body is composed of many members. Now, if you'll sit down and study 
the concept of the body of Christ, which is the church, you'll find that each one of the organs of the body has a spiritual meaning. For example, the feet. Blessed are the feet of those who carry the gospel of peace. We go and carry the gospel message. With our mouths we speak. There you have the gift of preaching, the gift of teaching. But tonight I want to dwell especially on the eyes of the church. Go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 9. 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 9. And we're going to study about the eyes of the church. 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 9. Here it's speaking about the early prophets in Israel. And we find these words written probably by Samuel. It says there, Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer. What do you see with? Your eyes, that's right. Let us go to the seer. For he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. So with what organ does the gift of prophecy have to do? It has to do with the eyes. The prophet is the seer. He sees things that normal, everyday people don't see. Now, if you go with me to Isaiah chapter 29... And verse 10, Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 10, you'll notice what happens when the prophetic voice is rejected and ignored. Isaiah 29 and verse 10. It says here, For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets. What does it mean to close the eyes? It means that God removes what? The prophets. And he has covered your heads, namely the seers. He's covered our heads so that we can no longer what? So that we can no longer see. Once again, the gift of prophecy is identified with the eyes. Now go with me to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. This is a very well-known verse. Sometimes we misuse it. You know, we say that we need to be a people of vision. We need to have a vision. But really what this verse is saying, that where there is no prophetic vision, the people perish. It's the same Hebrew word that is used for vision in the book of Daniel. Notice what it says in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Where there is no revelation... The King James says, where there is no what? Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. The King James says, the people perish. But happy is he who keeps the law. Now in the book of Revelation, we have seven churches. Which represent the totality of the history of the Christian church from apostolic times till the end of the age. What is the name of the last church? The name of the last church is Laodicea. And of course, Laodicea represents those Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians and Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and Catholics. Nice try. We have been clearly told that the church of Laodicea represents the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we should not say that proudly. We should be embarrassed that we are the Laodicean Church. Because God wants us to be on fire. He doesn't want us to be lukewarm. And you'll notice that in Revelation chapter 3, one of the grave problems of the Church of Laodicea is that it is what? Blind. Is it just possible that the reason why the church of Laodicea walks around in darkness, blind, is because the church of Laodicea has rejected 
or cast aside or ignored the prophetic gift, the eyes that God has given to his end time church? I believe the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Now, this evening, I want us to look at the subject of the spirit of prophecy, the eyes of the church, of God's remnant church, from a slightly different perspective than usual. What I want to do is talk about the great events of human history. Now, if we have to choose the great events of human history, we would obviously have to choose creation. We would have to choose the calling of the first prophet in the history of the world that we know of. We're going to notice that the name of that prophet was Enoch. We would have to, of course, take into account the worldwide flood, one of the great events of world history. We would have to include the exodus of Israel from Egypt. We would have to include the captivity of Israel in Babylon for 70 years. We would have to, of course, include the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And we would have to include also the beginning of the final judgment in the year 1844. These are the great events of salvation history. And these are the events that we're going to take a look at as we begin our study this evening. Now what we're going to do is take a look at several time prophecies that are mentioned in the Bible. And there's a certain modus operandi or a certain mode of operation that God follows when he gives these time prophecies. Allow me to explain what the process is like. What God does is he calls a prophet at one of his cardinal points of human history and he imparts to that prophet a message. Now, this message that God imparts to this prophet is a message of judgment. It's always a message of judgment. And connected with this message of judgment that God gives this prophet is a time prophecy, a period of time. In other words, it's linked with the message and with the idea of judgment. The interesting thing is that when God calls this first prophet, this message is not present truth for that generation. God gives the message to that prophet, a message of judgment, a message linked with the time prophecy, but he says to this prophet, this message I'm giving to you, but it really does not apply to your time. It is not present truth. Now, when the time prophecy transpires and it reaches its end, God raises up another prophet. And he gives this prophet the same message that he gave the first prophet. And he tells this prophet, the message of time that I gave to the first prophet is now fulfilled in your day and age. And that message which I gave to the first prophet is now present truth. It was not present truth for his day, but it is present truth for your day. And under the leadership of this second prophet, God always draws out a remnant. So let's review. God calls a prophet. He gives that prophet a message. It's a message of judgment. Linked with the message of judgment is a time prophecy. And God says to the prophet, I'm giving this to you, but it's not present truth at this moment. Time prophecy passes. God raises up another prophet, gives him the same message, a message of judgment, and says the time prophecy has now reached its con conclusion, and this message is now present truth. And that prophet leads out a remnant. Now what I want to do is study several of these great events of salvation history from this perspective. And of course we want to begin with the first prophet that the Bible mentions. Do you know who that is? The first prophet that the Bible mentions is Enoch. Go with me to the book of Jude, that little book right before Revelation, Jude, and we'll read verses 14 
and 15. Jude 14 and 15. Speaking about Enoch, it says, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. So was Enoch a prophet? Of course. Enoch, seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. To do what? To execute judgment, a message of judgment. To execute judgment on all. To convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So God calls Enoch and he gives Enoch a judgment message. Now let me ask you, what event was God talking about when he said that he was going to come with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment? The answer is twofold. I heard one answer which is correct. The second coming. But there is an event that foreshadows the second coming of Jesus. And that is the flood, the worldwide flood in the days of Noah. In fact, Jesus himself established a typological relationship between the flood and his second coming. When he said, as it was in the days of Noah, so also shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So Enoch was actually pointing to two great events. He was pointing to God coming in judgment upon the race that existed before the flood for their iniquity. And he was also, through that foreshadowing, pointing forward to the coming of God in judgment upon the world at the end of time. Now let me ask you, was this prophecy fulfilled in the days of Enoch? It wasn't. In fact, Enoch went to heaven before it happened. So was this message present truth for the days of Enoch? Absolutely not. Now what I want to show you is that along with this message of judgment, God also gave Enoch a time prophecy. Now we have to do a little searching to find the time prophecy. Go back with me to Genesis chapter 5, and let's examine this. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 25, 21. It says there, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. Now, in Genesis, names are important. More than 75 times in Genesis, the meaning of a name is underlined. A name isn't given simply because it's a name. The name has an important meaning. The name Methuselah has a very important meaning. And you're saying, what is the meaning of the name Methuselah? It actually comes from two Hebrew words. And I always have people write to me uh, emails after I preach this sermon and they say, how do you get this meaning out of the name of Methuselah? So I'm going to give you the numbers in strong concordance. For those of you who, who don't man, ha handle the Hebrew language, you can go to strong concordance, and I'm going to give you the numbers so that you can see that the two components of Methuselah's name, because it's a compound name composed of two Hebrew words, actually means when he dies, it will be sent. When he dies, it will be sent. The two Hebrew words are moot in strong concordance. It's number 4191, moot, and 7971, the word shalach, moot shalach, Methuselah. So the name, by the way, moot means to die, shalach means to send. So when he dies, it will be sent. Now, isn't that a strange name to give a son? When he dies, it will be sent. What would be your question? Well, when he dies, what will be sent? The fact is that what God was saying in the name of Methuselah, he was actually saying when the flood was going to come. Do you know that according to Jewish tradition, Methuselah died 10 years, 
10 days, excuse me, before the flood, according to Jewish tradition. He died the year of the flood, a few days before the flood. You say, well, but does the Bible uh, corroborate that view? Yes, it does. Go with me to Genesis chapter 5 and verse 25. We'll do a little math now. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 25. It says here, Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. So how long did Methuselah live until he begot his son Lamech? 187 years. But then notice what we find in verse 28. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And what was his name? Noah. So what do we do? We had 187 from Methuselah till he had Lamech. And 182 from the time that Lamech was born till he had his son Noah. And then let me ask you, how long did Noah live before the flood came? Go with me to Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. How old was Noah when the flood came? 600. Now what I want you to do is just do the addition. 187 plus 182 plus 600 years that Noah had when the flood came, how much does that give you? 969. So from the time that Methuselah was born till the flood came, how many years went by? 969. Now the question is, how old was Methuselah when he died? Huh. Isn't that interesting? Genesis 5, 27. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 27. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Did Methuselah die the year of the flood? Yes, he did. So his name, when he dies, it will be sent, was a prophetic name. Connected with Enoch's message of judgment was the specific date when the judgment was going to come, when the flood was going to come. Now, as I've mentioned, this was not present truth for Enoch's day. He was translated to heaven. And the world existed still for many hundreds of years before this prophecy was fulfilled. So my question is this. When this period was coming to its end, did God raise up another prophet that spoke to the same issue that Enoch had spoken to and saying the message that Enoch spoke about, about God coming to execute judgment, is now going to be fulfilled in this day? Yes or no? Who was that prophet? You know very well, that prophet was Noah. Notice 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. By the way, was the message of Noah a message of judgment? Oh, it most certainly was. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight persons, a what? A preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Notice the same word, the ungodly that we read in the book of Jude. So who made the message of Enoch present truth? It was made present truth by Noah, who was raised up by God at the very end of this period. In fact, if Methuselah did die 10 days before the flood, Noah concluded his message very close to the moment when the door of the ark closed and then seven days later it began to rain. And by the way, did Noah draw out a remnant and save a remnant? Yes, he did. Not all were destroyed in the judgment. Now let's go to our second example. I believe that the call of Abraham was a great event in human history, don't you? It really marks the beginning of the Hebrew nation, the call of Abraham. Very important event. 
Now go with me to Genesis chapter 20 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 20 and verse 7. Did you know that Abraham was a prophet? We usually think of him as a patriarch. But the Bible says that he was a prophet. By the way, the Bible says that, uh, that Abraham lied twice. He lied to Pharaoh and he lied to Abimelech. This is when he lied to Abimelech. He said, Sarah is my sister. You say, no, he didn't lie. She was his half-sister. Well, a half-truth is a full lie. <laughs> because he told the truth with the intention of lying. God takes into account the intention. Not only the words. We've already studied this this morning. And so, God gives Abimelech a dream. And he says, don't you touch that woman. Now let's read that in chapter 20 and verse 7. Now therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is what? A prophet. And he will play for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Question, was Abraham a prophet? Yes, he was. Now, did God give Abraham a judgment message connected with a time prophecy? Yes, he did. Go with me to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. And let's read verses 13 and 14. Genesis 15, 13 and 14. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. Is that a time prophecy? Yes. But what's going to happen at the end of this period? Verse 14. And also the nation whom they serve, I will... Ah, message of judgment. I will judge. Afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. So did God give Abraham a message connected with a time prophecy, and it was a message of judgment? Absolutely. Was this message present truth for the days of Abraham? Absolutely not. In fact, notice what we find in verse 15. God says, Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers and in peace you shall be buried at a good old age. In other words, you're not going to be in bondage. You're not going to go through this experience. In other words, this message of judgment linked with the time prophecy did not apply to the days of Abraham even though God gave this message to Abraham. Now let me ask you, when this period came to an end, did God raise up another prophet who spoke to the same issue that Abraham had spoken to? Absolutely. What was his name? Moses, the Exodus, another great pillar of salvation history. We're not talking about small insignificant events here. We're talking about the first prophet, we're talking about the flood, we're talking about the call of Abraham, the, the beginning of the Hebrew nation. We're talking about uh, the exodus from Egypt. These are the great events of Old Testament history. And we'll notice also in a few moments of New Testament history. Now some people say, now wait a minute, was Moses a prophet? Well, go, to, go with me to the book of Hosea. The book of Hosea, chapter 12. By the way, Hosea is easy to find because he comes right after Daniel. Hosea chapter 12, and let's read verse 13 and also verse 14. Actually, let's just read verse 13. It says there, By a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet he was what? By a prophet he was preserved. Did Moses lead out a remnant from bondage? when that nation was judged. Absolutely. And you see, so you see this interesting way in which God is working. He calls a prophet, gives that prophet a message. It's a message of judgment. Connected with the message of judgment is a time prophecy. It's not present truth. At the end of that period, God raises another prophet, gives that prophet the same message, says the time period has now come to an end. You make this present truth. And he draws out, when the judgment comes, a remnant, a remnant people. Now let's go 
to our next biblical example. Would you say that the Babylonian captivity was one of the great events of Old Testament history? Absolutely. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 25 and verses 11 and 12. Jeremiah 25 and verses 11 and 12. Very interesting what God says here to the prophet. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon, how long? Seventy years. Now what was going to happen after the seventy years? Notice verse 12. Then it will come to pass, when seventy years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon. Is that a judgment? Most certainly. I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So did God give Jeremiah a message of judgment? Yes. Was it connected with the time prophecy? Absolutely. Was it present truth for Jeremiah's day? It was not present truth for Jeremiah's day. In fact, uh, we have every evidence that Jeremiah had passed from the scene before the 70 year prophecy actually began. But God gave it to Jeremiah. Now let me ask you, do you suppose that at the end of the 70 years God was going to raise another prophet who would make the message of um, the message of Jeremiah present truth? Well, now what makes you think that? Because it's the way in which God operates. Now who was that prophet that made the prophecy of Jeremiah present truth? His name was Daniel. Go with me to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, and let's read verses 1 and 2. Daniel 9, verses 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, this is around the year 538, the 70 years end in the year 536. So it's right before the 70 years come to an end. So it says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldees, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. What was Daniel even studying? He was studying the prophecy of the 70 years. He knew that the captivity had begun in the year 605. He says, this prophecy is about to come to an end. I want to know how I can lead in this. By the way, just as a sidelight, you know, when, when Cyrus came to Babylon and he dried the riverbed of the Euphrates and he came into the city, Daniel was actually waiting for Cyrus there. And I'm going to dramatize for effect. Daniel says, Cyrus, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> and Cyrus says, what do you mean? He says, yeah, do you know that your name was prophesied over a hundred years before you were born? And he opened up to Cyrus the prophecy of Isaiah 45 and verse 1. Where Cyrus was mentioned by name. And he says, Cyrus, you are a man of destiny. God has called you to deliver his people so that they can go back and build their temple and they can rebuild their city and they can rebuild their religion. Let me ask you, did Daniel make that message of Jeremiah present truth? He most certainly did. And Cyrus cooperated with God. In fact, if you read Ezra chapter 1, it says that Cyrus gave the decree to release God's people because the God of heaven told him to. Isn't that an amazing way in which God leads in human history? So the one who makes this present truth is Daniel. Was this message a message of judgment? Yes, Babylon had just fallen. 
And God's people, after the 70 years, were about to be delivered from bondage, just like Jeremiah had said. So Daniel makes the prophecy of Jeremiah present truth. Let me ask you, did Daniel lead out in taking out a remnant back to their land to reestablish the true religion? He most certainly did. So you always have a remnant. Now let's go to our next example. We have another prophecy in the Old Testament which is known as the prophecy of the 70 weeks. I'm not going to read this prophecy because most of us probably have read it. We've heard sermons about the prophecy of the 70 weeks. Basically, the prophecy of the 70 weeks was given to Daniel and God is saying that 490 years were established for literal Israel either to accept the Messiah or reject him and be uh, set aside as God's special theocratic people. Now, especially significant in the prophecy of the 70 weeks is the last week. Would you agree with that? In other words, the 70 weeks are pointing, yeah, the rebuilding, uh, you know, the restoring, the rebuilding of Jerusalem, that's important. But the whole importance of reestablishing their religion and the sacrifices, etc., is because of what the Messiah is going to do at the end of this period. And so the last seven years of this prophecy are particularly important. And there are three great events in this prophecy in that last week that we need to take into account. Number one, the prophecy says that during the last week or at the beginning of the last week, the Messiah would be anointed. By the way, that's redundant because Messiah means anointed. In other words, the Messiah would come and the Messiah would be would become the anointed one. That's one event. The second event is that in the middle of the week, the Messiah would be what? Cut off. In other words, the Messiah would die. And the last event was that probation was going to close. God was going to come in judgment and close the door of probation for the Hebrew nation for rejecting the Messiah. That was the prophecy of the 70 weeks that God gave to Daniel in Daniel 9. Now let me ask you, was this present truth for the days of Daniel? Listen, not even the restoring and the rebuilding of Jerusalem was fulfilled in the days of Daniel. Daniel was an old man when he received this revelation of the 70 weeks. He was long dead before the 70 weeks even began to be fulfilled, much less the last week. So this message, this time prophecy that dealt with judgment. By the way, was Jesus judged on the cross? He most certainly was. He was judged for the sins of the world. In other words, the judgment of the Father fell upon Him. So the whole idea of the last week is a message of what? A message of judgment. Well, let me ask you. At the end of this period, did God raise up another prophet as this last week was about to begin, that made this message of Daniel present truth. What was his name? John the Baptist. Now here's where things really get amazing. Because we have three events. We have the baptism of the promised one. We have the death of the promised one. And we have the judgment on the nation that has rejected the promised one. Who baptized Jesus when he was anointed by the Holy Spirit? John the Baptist. So who made the anointing of Messiah present truth? John the Baptist. How did John the Baptist introduce Jesus? Behold what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What happened to lambs? They were slain. They were killed. And so not only did John the Baptist baptize Jesus when he's anointed by the Holy Spirit, but also he preaches Jesus as the one who would die in the middle of the week. He's making that last week present truth in his day and age. Now what about the idea that probation was going to close for the Hebrew nation if they rejected the Messiah? Go with me to Matthew chapter 3 and let's take a look at this. Matthew chapter 3. And I want to read several verses here in Matthew chapter 3. Here John is beginning his ministry. 
And uh, he wasn't very politically correct, to be honest with you. Uh, he was pretty strong, in fact. Notice verse 5. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers. That's a good way of introducing your sermon, isn't it? <laughs> Winning friends and influencing people. He says, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits. I want you to remember this. Bear fruits. What is it that bears fruit? A tree. Thank you very much. Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. In other words, fruits that flow from repentance, that come from repentance. And then he says, And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. In Desire of Ages, Ellen White explains that he was not pointing to stones he was pointing to the Roman soldiers and the Gentiles that had come to the baptism of John. Because the Jews called the Gentiles swine, they called them dogs, and they called them stones. Because they had a hard heart. They had an uncircumcised stony heart. So they said, you're stones. What John the Baptist is saying, listen, don't think that you're so great because you're the children of Abraham, because you're of the chosen nation. God can choose children of Abraham from these Gentiles, from these stones. It is a veiled prophecy of what was going to happen when God turned from the Jewish nation to the Gentiles. And he continued saying in verse 11, actually verse 10, and even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Ah, so now we, we have the concept of the tree. The root is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear what? Good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Do you know who he was talking about when he says every tree that does not bear fruit will be cast into the fire? He was comparing the Hebrew nation to a tree. You say, how do you know that? Because we meet this tree twice more in the ministry of Jesus. Did you know that John the Baptist began his preaching about six months before Jesus began to preach? Interesting. Now, I don't want you to turn there. I just want you to listen, but you might want to write down Luke 13 and verses 1 to 6. There we meet the tree again. Jesus is giving a parable and he says a certain owner of a vineyard had a fig tree in his vineyard. By the way, the vineyard represents the world. The owner of the vineyard is God the Father. And the tree, this particular fig tree, it represents the nation of Israel. And so it says there, you know, I've been coming now for how long? For three years, looking for fruit on this tree, and it has no fruit. That's what the owner of the vineyard says. So he says, cut it down. Why should it cumber the ground? Does that sound like something that John the Baptist said? If the tree, do if the tree doesn't bear fruit, it should be what? Cut down. Now you have this fig tree, the owner of the vineyard says, chop it down. Because it doesn't have any fruit. But the vine dresser loved that tree. And so he says, allow me to work with it for one more year. The chronology is interested, interesting. You know, those who have studied the chronology of the Gospels have concluded that this parable was told by Jesus approximately two and a half years into his ministry. Plus six months that John the Baptist had been preaching about the tree is three years. And Jesus had one more year left to his ministry. So the chronology is very, very important. So Jesus, the vine dresser, is saying, leave it, leave it. I'll take special care of it. I will fertilize it. I will water it. I will dedicate special attention to it. And if after the year it bears fruit, fine. If not, we'll cut it down. We meet that fig tree again. 
just a couple of days before Jesus died. He sees a fig tree in the distance. And he says to his disciples, I'm hungry. Look at the fig tree. It's, it's full of leaves. By the way, in Israel, the, the figs come out first and then the leaves announce that the tree has figs. And so if he sees this fig tree with leaves, the, the fig tree has to have fruit. And so he says, let's go get some fruit. And when he gets there, all he finds is a tree full of leaves. Very beautiful indeed, externally, but no fruit. The tree was mocking Jesus. And what did Jesus say? No one ever eat fruit from you again. And the Bible says that the next day, the disciples and Jesus went by that place. And Peter said, look, the tree that you cursed yesterday has dried up at the roots. What happens when a tree dries up at the roots? It is finished. That's it. And why did this tree not produce fruit? Because they rejected whom? The Messiah. You see, there's another, there's another parable of Jesus of the vineyard. He sends uh, laborers to the vineyard, you know, to pick up the fruit. And what do they do with them? They kill them. By the way, this is talking about the period between Mount Sinai and the Babylonian captivity. So he says, okay, you know, I'm still going to give them a chance. So he sends more messengers, more than the first. That's between the Babylonian captivity and the coming of the Messiah. And they did the same with them. So the owner of the vineyard says, at last I will send my son. They will respect my son. They didn't render the fruits. But when the son came, they said, oh, this is the heir. Let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And so they took the son, and they killed him, and they cast him outside the vineyard. And so Jesus says, what do you suppose the owner of the vineyard is going to do with those wicked individuals? They, have, they don't have the clue that Jesus is talking about them. They say, oh, he will destroy those original uh, workers in the vineyard miserably, and he will give his vineyard to others who bear the fruits in their season." And Jesus says, the kingdom will be taken from you and will be given to a nation producing the fruits thereof. So let me ask you, did John the Baptist also talk about the last event that was going to transpire in the 70 weeks, the closing of the door of probation for the Hebrew nation? Absolutely. Why would John the Baptist talk about these three specific things? My, my. The anointing of Messiah, the death of Messiah, and the closing of probation for the Hebrew nation as God's chosen people. I'm not saying that, that individuals cannot be saved, but as a theocracy, the door closed. Why would John the Baptist preach these? For the simple reason that John the Baptist was making present truth what had been spoken of by Daniel many, many years before. By the way, did Jesus lead out a remnant when the Jewish nation was rejected? Absolutely. There were 120 in the upper room. And then soon they grew by thousands. The remnant grew phenomenally. Now I want to come to our last example. You see, the prophecy of the 70 weeks is only the first part of a greater prophecy that Daniel gave. The prophecy of the 2300 days. Unto 2300 days, and the sanctuary shall be what? shall be cleansed. Was that present truth for the days of Daniel? That wasn't present truth for the days of Daniel. You think 1844 was present truth for, for the days of Daniel? Of course not. It was present truth for later on when the prophecy of the, the 70 weeks had been fulfilled and then 1810 further years leading you to 1844 was what Daniel was prophesying. It wasn't present truth. In fact, God said, this book about the 2300 days is sealed until the time of the end. It's not for you, but at the time of the end, this book is going to be open. And knowledge of the prophecies, particularly the prophecy having to do with the 2300 days, will be increased. Now here's my question. Do you suppose that at the end of this period, God would raise up another prophet 
to make present truth the message that was given originally to Daniel. Now what makes you think that? Because that's the way that God has operated all the way through. Question. Did God raise up a prophet? In 1844, actually we need to look at it as a prophetic movement because the Millerites actually announced the beginning of the judgment in 1844 although they had the event wrong. But then did God raise up a prophet to correct and explain what truly had happened on October 22, 1844? Absolutely. Explaining this specific prophecy. Now let me ask you, when God raised up Ellen White, why didn't he teach her first of all about the Trinity? Why didn't he give her health reform first? Why, why didn't he say, you know, preach the Sabbath or the state of the dead? Because in order to make the original prophecy present truth, she had to talk about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Amen. And if you look at the early visions of Ellen White, this is the amazing thing in the book Early Writings. Every one of those visions has the purpose to explain what happened October 22, 1844. Every single one of them. The vision of the platform, the vision of those who were kneeling before the throne, and then some people remain there and Satan takes the place at the throne. All of those early visions of Ellen White, the one of the halo around the fourth commandment, all of them have the purpose of explaining what was going to happen in 1844. Now do you know, as we draw this to an end, do you know that around the same time, many religious and philosophical movements arose. In fact, you know, New England was called the burned over district because there were so many fanatical movements, so many religious movements that arose that people were burned out. They didn't know where to turn. For example, within the same time frame, you have Christian science originating with their prophet, Mary Baker Eddy. Mormonism. In fact, do you know that that uh, Mount Kumora, where supposedly uh, Joseph Smith received the golden plates that he translated into the Book of Mormon from an ancient Egyptian language, do you know that that's only a very few miles from where Hiram Edson had his intuition about Jesus going from the holy into the most holy place of the sanctuary? Very interesting. So Mormonism, with their prophet Joseph Smith, arose around that time. Theosophy. Today we call it New Age. And their champion was Helena Blavatsky, originated around this time. The Baha'i religion originated around this time with Abdul Baha. Spiritualism originated with their pioneers. The Fox sisters and Andrew Jackson Davis, I won't talk any, any more about him. Pentecostalism originated through a woman called Margaret MacDonald. The Jehovah's Witnesses originated within this period. Evolutionism with their prophet Charles Darwin. Marxism originated during this period. Futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy and preterism came into Protestantism during this time frame, during this period. What do you suppose the devil was trying to do? He was trying to confuse because the devil knew that something was going to happen in 1844. So he said, I'm going to bring confusion so that people don't know where to turn. Do you know how I know that Ellen White is the true prophet? Because she is the only one who spoke about Daniel 8.14. While Joseph Smith was saying that you can marry many women. And Charles Russell of the Jehovah's Witnesses was selling miraculous wheat. And while Mary Baker Eddy was teaching that, we, that our body is an illusion. And while spiritualism was teaching that we can communicate with the dead. And Pentecostalism was teaching that we need to speak in tongues. And evolution was teaching that we come from monkeys. You know, I tell people, if you want to make a monkey of yourself, that's fine. 
I have no problem with that. But I came from the hands of a creator, from Jesus Christ. And so, folks, God has raised a prophet. And through that prophet, he has preserved and brought out a remnant. The remnant church. The Seventh-day Adventist church. And woe to us if we should shove aside, reject, ignore this precious light that God has given to his people. You know, one thing that shows me that Ellen White was on the right track is how much people hate her. Does anybody want to show me a prophet of the Bible that the people loved? Do you know of any? Prophets were in dungeons. They were put, they were put in, in uh, tree trunks and sawed in half. They were persecuted. They were hated. So if today there's many people who are critical of Ellen White and hate the writings of Ellen White, it tells me that she was on the right track. And do you know why people don't like Ellen White? Because she meddles. Because she cramps our style. She tells us that we need to change. That there's certain rules that God wants us to follow for our joy and for our happiness. Not to make us slaves, but to make us happy. And people say, I want to live my life. Let me live my life the way I live it. And therefore, they have to cast Ellen White aside. It is time that we recover this special gift in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That we shake the dust off the red books. We open them. We read them. And we make them part of our lives. And we share the message of God for the world in these last days. I'll finish with this uh, illustration. You know, I grew up in the countries of Colombia and Venezuela. So I speak Spanish. My dad was a conference president, so I would travel with him sometimes. When I was a teacher down there, because I taught theology for six years after uh, my parents came back to the U.S., I went back down as a missionary. But one day I remember visiting an elder of a Seventh-day Adventist church. And the moment I walked through the door of his home, he proudly took me to his library. And he said, Pastor Barr, I want to show you. I have every single one of Ellen White's books. And so I looked. He, he must have had at least 30 or more books all in line. And I looked at him and I said, but, brother, those books still have the cellophane on them. <laughs> he says, well, I can't take the cellophane off because if I do, they'll get old. I said, brother, what good is it having those books on your bookcase all nice and beautiful when you should be taking those books, taking off the cellophane, opening them, assimilating the message so that it makes a difference in your life. Isn't it time that we take the cellophane off the books? I think it is. And so I challenge you as we leave this place to dedicate a time each day to read the Spirit of Prophecy. Let's encourage our churches to read the Spirit of Prophecy. And I assure you that if we follow the principles that Ellen White presents, we will be a happy, joyful people. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this wonderful gift that you have given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Father, forgive us for ignoring it. Forgive us for rejecting it. Forgive us for rationalizing it. And Father, we ask that you will make us submissive children of yours. That we might be like Samuel. Speak, Lord, for your servant here. I ask, Lord, that when we leave this place, that we will make up our minds through the power of your Spirit that we are going to study the spirit of prophecy and make it part of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for having been with us, and we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.